you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. Well, we uh, continue to watch your back. We continue to um, think about topics that will be of interest to you, that will be relevant to your lives. We know that that our, uh, our listeners have concerns about what are my costs of living going to be over the next 15 to 20 years. Our listeners, we know, have a horizon that's a little shorter than perhaps when – Many people are graduating college or when we all were starting out our careers. So we want to know not what's going to happen in maybe in a very futuristic sense. We want to know what's going to happen in the next 10, 20, maybe even 30 years, but certainly no more for most of our clients, and we suspect many of you. Um, you know, it's a crazy time, Jill. I, I don't know that I recall a time in which there was more uncertainty um, and and more dissatisfaction than yeah. you sense right now. It, it's the only way I can describe it is like a bad disaster movie. Yeah, yeah, and we've just had multiple crises this year, and the coronavirus, you know, kind of launched us into a number of experiences we've never had, and and meanwhile we have unrest and protests and other things that also have brought an element of uncertainty. So um, I think that from an economic standpoint, a financial standpoint, it's difficult to chart a course right now. Mm -hmm. I'll be the first to admit that I'm baffled about how the market could be where it is. I mean, here we are, as of the time that we're recording this, a few days from when you're hearing it, uh, we have a Dow that's above 27,000. The S&P is near a record high. NASDAQ has reached a record high. And all this at a time we, when we have incredible unemployment. We're showing unemployment figures still above 20 million. Yeah. And we're showing that we have a 14% plus or minus, some, some tenths of a point, unemployment. Now, it's true that the most recent unemployment figures, which seem in Congress, showed at first an 8 million person gain. But I think now that is being questioned. It's probably going to be – it's going to be adjusted downward, I'm pretty confident. But still, there appears to be a gain. And and we have to wonder, you know, how do we explain these series of events and this economic performance that we're seeing in the market? Uh, yeah. And how do you explain that? It just doesn't seem to make sense. Well, we know that a number of industries are going to be in – Poor financial shape. Some may even be eradicated. Some have suggested, yeah. for example, that that viewing on major movie screens, AMC and mm-hmm. the others, who are large national companies that operate these theaters, right. that that many will be filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. AMC has said as much. They're the first or second largest in the country, unless their their audience returns by I think they said August. Right. At the latest September, unless they get back to normality by then, they're going to have to seek lending or file Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now, does anybody believe that people are going to be as they were before in movie theaters by August, sitting shoulder to shoulder? I don't with think people? so. I, I mean, I really don't think that's in the cards. But in fairness, I think a number of industries that have been particularly shocked by this were already on their heels even going into this. And, and a good example is the theater industry. There there were already trends, technological trends, the streaming thing yeah. where you now have Disney and you have Apple and uh, Netflix that are tending to create products in which they will unveil them and have unveiled them initially mm-hmm. online and through which people can download. Right, in their own home. In their own home. So the model of a movie theater was already perhaps threatened. Remember Blockbuster? Who yeah. Would have, who would have thought? Everyone thought that was such cutting edge at one time. We're old enough to say that. We remember when we thought that was real cutting edge, a place to go and pick up a movie and take it home and watch it. And that very quickly became a dinosaur. I don't think there's any movie stores left. Remember those machines? 
Well, the red box. The red mean? box. Well, that's they're it. still around at Schnucks. I've seen those at Schnucks. Now, why would that be? I don't understand that. When you can when you can subscribe to any number of online right. services that will give you those movies, yeah, including Apple. But in any case, so a number of industries that that have been shaken by technological and other developments. So we go into coronavirus, and of course, that's the death nail for mm-hmm. many of these. Even though you can't explain their their failure or their extinction entirely based upon coronavirus, so we know a lot of that's happening. But otherwise, otherwise profitable businesses and industries are still, you know, suffering immensely. I mean, look at restaurants. There are some restaurants that will obviously will never come back. Hundreds, perhaps yeah. thousands. I'm yeah. sure thousands if we talk nationally. And and that that's an example of an industry that's been incredibly hard hit. And and we we can name them. We can sit here and list things. And many of it is even supply-based. A number of manufacturers in the U.S., which were listed in the Wall Street Journal about a couple weeks ago, they listed like seven or eight just as examples of companies who are announced they're closing their manufacturing facilities, mostly in Michigan, Ohio, Mm -hmm. um, uh, mainly northeastern states. But these these industries will not come back. And then there are the, the ramifying effects that they had a number of suppliers who in turn had suppliers who in turn had suppliers. So, you know, when you when you look at the cascading results of the coronavirus and then you look at a stock market that is near its high. Now, remember, the high of the Dow was just over 30,000 before right. all this hit. So 30,000 is the high water mark. And to think that we're this close, above 27,000, and, of course, we talked about NASDAQ and Standard Poor's. So... I have to tell you, I'm baffled. I'm not somebody to come to for advice. First of all, I'm never somebody to come to for advice on investments. <laughs> but however, especially now, it just looks uh, like a very confusing picture. It certainly very, does. Very foggy in terms of predicting. I can just say this, and and I may very well be wrong. I'm certainly not betting on the market continuing its climb and, and us being as if the coronavirus didn't happen economically in this country. I just can't imagine a market that's priced that way. And it, it's yeah. very close to being priced that way right now. As a matter of fact, we could say it's priced as if the coronavirus didn't happen. It's priced as if the unemployment, the lost businesses, the lost manufacturers, all those things that we know about, it's it's priced as if those things didn't happen. Now, uh, many economists explain this entirely in terms of the actions of the Fed and and the, the the fiscal stimulus, and it's true that when you throw out there injections of money into the mm-hmm. market, uh, like has never been done. This is definitely the first time in human experience that an ex- well, should I say Nazi Germ- <laughs> uh, uh just before the Nazis took power in Germany. You know, you had in the Weimar Republic, you had, you know, lots of printing of money. So it's not as if this is not the first time that we've had a lot of printing of money. Um, that's happened throughout history with, with fiat um, uh, money. But but in this case, though, it, I think it is the first time that you've had a partnership between fiscal and, and federal Fed policy that has, has worked together to stimulate so much mm-hmm. and for it not to show – any increase in inflation in the short term. So that is baffling. And some are wondering, you know, what does it take to produce inflation? I mean, we can all agree. We don't have to debate whether or not, yeah, there is some point at which the Fed can issue money will get inflation. They can't do it forever. It's not modern monetary theory, as some would tell us you could do. Uh, And let's hope that policy is not implemented. (laughs) But anyway, there are advocates, mainly on the left, who are advocates of modern monetary theory, which says that, look, the way you get rid of poverty is you just tell the Fed to print more money. And they just print the money. And and the cause of poverty, in in its most literal sense, is a lack of money. So when you give people money, you get rid of poverty. I mean, I know that that sounds foolish and simplistic, uh, but believe it or not, that's actually uh, an economic theory. Uh, that that could very well be implemented, <laughs> depending mm-hmm. on who occupies the White House or whatnot. But anyway, so um, we unless you believe in that, and I don't think any reasonable person does, then at some point we know inflation occurs when you keep increasing the supply of money, just like in the Weimar Republic in the 20s in Germany. Um, so when is that point? So it's a fair it's fair to ask that question. Yeah. We're right now above six trillion dollars. 
And not all of that was flowing through the Fed, but some through fiscal policy as well, which is debt spending. Um, so you have to wonder, at what point do you see inflation? Do you see the value of the dollar go down, which is what inflation is? Sure. And the way you measure that is it's not really that the price of goods go up. I mean, you can, you can say that's true, but a more accurate statement is the value of money goes down. And so we're not seeing signs of that, at least overtly. Some would say, yeah, you can, you can spot areas among products and services where prices have gone up, but, uh, but we're not seeing it across the board like the consumer price index, which is you know, reflective of a basket, right. a basket of products and services. So I still expect that there will be inflation. I think many of you listening to me now, I think that you, you uh, may have similar expectations. So it's hard to, to pour your life savings into the Dow Jones or in the market right now. Um, but again, what do I know? Maybe we'll talk in three <laughs> weeks and it'll be 35000 I can tell you if it's 35000 I would run in yeah. the opposite direction, yeah. not toward it. But in any case, uh, we thought then, um, given, given the challenges and the uncertainty that all of us face now, and, and it's uncertainty not just about economic matters, but uncertainty about our health. Yeah. Now, thankfully, that picture has been improving, uh, but still, it's a lesson to be remembered of what many of us have become more conscious of over the past several months, and that's the possibility that we can catch a virus and we could die, and and those around us who are important in our lives as well. So, so we need to keep that in mind as we go forward and plan our lives that we're all vulnerable, and and especially at a time when the economic situation and the political situation yeah. uh, is so uncertain. Very uncertain times. So who better to have on the show than somebody that you guys have liked in the past? We had Teresa Yao on before. From Tucker Allen. Tucker Hi. Allen. <laughs> an attorney does Tucker Allen. Of course, many of you know Tucker Allen uh, does exclusively estate planning, um, elder, elder law. And uh, let's talk about some of the things that that you need to have in place um, to, to be as confident as you should be as you go forward. Yeah, and even without a pandemic, you know, I think it's very important that you don't delay creating an estate plan, Teresa. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the pandemic is just a giant reminder to all of us that, you know, our mortality, it's like it just puts a spotlight on our mortality. And I think that has, you know urged people to get their estate plans done at this time, but even outside of pandemic, you know, this is a reminder that we never know what's down the line. A wake-up call, right, really. Exactly. And, and, you know, it's something that uh, some people have done some sort of planning, but they've not done it recently. The thing about creating an estate plan is things change over time. And, mm -hmm. and, and this is the sort of subject where, depending on your mindset, you either walk away uh, and you, you don't think about it or you lean in. And people who, who've gone through crises of health, who've gone through financial crises, I mean, they tend to be more conscious of the, how vulnerable they are. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about estate planning, uh, I know it has potentially a very boring ring to it. To be honest <laughs> with you, you know, if, were I, did I not know as much about the subject as I do, I would find it boring. So the point is, though, that it's it's hugely important for our lives in a practical way, mm -hmm. and it's important for the lives of those we care about. So once people get how how important estate planning is, then it's not a boring subject, and and that's the reason that we talk about it every now and then on this show, not as often as we should, quite frankly. Uh, we should be doing this, you know, much more often than we do. But we try to circle back and deal with this topic. Uh, once a month or so, and and we think it it's it's critical that that you be aware we have failed you if we do not continually bring to your attention the things that you need to be thinking about for the balance of your life and for those you care the most about. And I think people do want to be educated on this matter mm -hmm. um, to know what steps they need to take um, because it, it can be very very complicated. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, I know I'm a little biased in this, but estate planning for clients can be really, you know, 
like refreshing to talk through just because it's it's about their lives. It's about people in their lives, their loved ones and how they want to take care of them. It's that kind of area of practice where, you know, when I'm meeting with my clients, they share very like personal family stories and it's like more of a bonding experience. So in right. that way, it can be kind of fun. And they really get into <laughs> it, right? I mean, yeah. we all enjoy talking about our plans mm-hmm. and our future. Yeah, uh-huh. And so you're right. I mean, once people get into an office with a good attorney and they're able to share and discuss and think about these many things, you're right. The the clients are never bored uh, once they have gotten to the point where they're they're dealing with the matter. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just stimulating that initial level of interest. Mm -hmm. It's shocking the number of people that go out of this world with no plan. Yeah. Even people with assets. It is very scary. And, and you know, don't you think before you consult an attorney that you should sit down with your family and have a meeting and say, okay, I need to create an estate plan. Let's talk about this. And before you go in, step in uh, to an attorney's office. Yeah, I mean, generally, I would say yes. It's probably good to talk it through with, with your family, family members about kind of what your plans are. But Every family is different. Some families have more like conflict, yeah. conflict, <laughs> tense relationships, and it might not be the best idea to sit everybody down because then you won't. Then it might just become overwhelming, and you might end up not getting to it at the end of it. I guess it depends on the family. Yeah, but okay. definitely, I think it's like if if you can't do it all together, sit down. It'd be nice to be able to sit down with one of your family members, maybe like with each of them individually, doing one on ones, kind of talk it through. Because in terms of estate planning, you're you are appointing people in roles of responsibility, so it is imprudent for you to talk to the people that you want to appoint in these roles. But it, it is right, though. It's it's a shame there can't be a single rule because then yeah. people you know, would find this whole subject simpler. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they may not need us either. But the, as you said, um, there is no single rule. And for example, I've read, and I, I know you've probably read, Teresa, where lawyers will be talking at seminars. We go to seminars periodically on a subject of estate planning, and lawyers present, and we present. And and so uh, it's not unusual for someone to be saying, look, if you want to head off a will fight, if you want to prevent all this conflict that occurs after you're gone, mm-hmm. the best thing to do is prepare your family for what's about to happen. Explain mm-hmm. why you've decided to perhaps give control over the assets, managing the assets. For example, if this is a trust, and this doesn't assume you're rich. Let me, those of you who are thinking, oh, trust, it means, you know, rich people, but not right. at all. But but if people who want to have someone control the assets they've left to their grandchildren or even to their own children over time, then they have to put somebody in charge. And, and it doesn't have to be a family member, but it often is. But when you say, Teresa, what, 75, 80, 90 percent of the time? Maybe like 90, 95 percent of <laughs> yeah. the time most a family pe- member. Most people would yeah. rather deal with a family member yeah. than a, than an institutional person or a, a lawyer or some other third party. Mm-hmm. So often that ruffles feathers. And, and all too often, yeah. clients go out of the world without having any conversation. So it comes out of left field, and the person who's been kind of passed over, then – Often the, their first thought is, wait, there's something wrong here. My dad or my mother could not have wanted this. So I, you know, I'm going to challenge this. And that's yeah. often the source of problems that come. So that's a case mm-hmm. we'd agree where there should be a conversation. Oh, absolutely. And especially like in terms of appointing people in like the responsibility roles, like the trustees or the executors in the will, like – some people are like, well, why wasn't I appointed trustee? But a lot of times that that position comes with a lot of duties. And headaches. Ob- headaches. Yeah. And then so when a parent appoints one child in that position, it's not that they're showing preference because the other children could be equal beneficiaries in the trust. And usually are, right? And usually are, like – Major, large majority of time are. And then so I think it's like having that conversation ahead of time saying, hey, even though I'm pointing your brother or sister as trustee, it doesn't mean that I'm favoring one over the other because actually in terms of distribution of assets, everybody's being treated equally. It's just one person is kind of getting the you know, responsibility on the shoulders to make those distributions. Right, right. Yeah. And if you're just joining us, we're speaking with Teresa Yao, attorney at Tucker Allen. And, and Teresa, I want to ask you, in your experience, uh, when someone appoints a child, is it usually the oldest child that's appointed, would you say? 
Actually, I mean, usually if the if it's like the most standard family and there isn't any like character traits like popping out, then yeah, normally it's the oldest child. Kind of a, but... almost a tradition some of our clients feel, don't they? Yeah, I feel like it, it's kind of that good backup if you really don't want to ruffle feathers, just saying, you know what, the oldest goes first. And sometimes if the oldest isn't like appointed, sometimes they feel slighted. Mm-hmm. But I also say like, Sometimes the oldest isn't the most responsible financially and isn't the most savvy with that kind of decision. So mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be. And a lot of times people, I find this kind of funny because I find that daughters seem to be appointed a lot mm-hmm. in the in the fiduciary roles. So well, you yeah. know the I, I, you know we don't want to stereotype at all, but but sometimes the daughters, um, you know, there's not this competitive relationship like sometimes there are with the sons. Mm-hmm. And, and the daughters sometimes have been a little more nurturing to the parents. They tend to more be the caregivers, I think. Uh, yeah, I think if nothing else, society has kind of put them in that role. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, that's probably a true statement. Yeah. Um, it's broad brush stroking. Obviously, there are sons that are very good as <laughs> yes. well. So. Yeah, yeah. But so then sometimes daughters are the least controversial choice. Uh, it, it, as Teresa was saying, it's so driven by the facts. And and but it I'll tell you one thing that does seem very common. Who whichever child it is that perhaps is best suited, is that discomfort in the parent with choosing that person, especially when it's not the oldest. The oldest, as you said, Teresa, you have some cover. You can yeah. say well, and yeah. so often that that won't be questioned. But but often it's not the oldest that should do it, and that's when clients sometimes struggle. So what clients start saying is. And I get this. They say, well, look, why don't I cut? Can I just put them all on? And, you know. Can you do that? Yeah, but Teresa respond to that. Um, yeah. So a lot of times people are like, oh, I, can't we just like list them all at the same level, have co-trustees, like three, four co-trustees? And technically, yes, you can do that. But it's kind of setting – it's kind of foiling the fact that you're trying to make a plan that is like efficient administration and making sure that people are actually getting the assets, right? Because when you have co-trustees, a lot of times you can have stalemates. People can disagree. And in a way, when you do individual by individual in orders of succession, it's kind of like – it provides more order like in your rule book for how your children are supposed to follow, right? Right. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it is um, – it is a touchy subject, but the point is, it's got to be done. And and there are so many options. There really are. There are, is even the option, which clients don't often choose, of a third party. Mm-hmm. But sometimes on those occasions when a third party is chosen, it's just because there either are no kids or there are no kids that can competently do it, or it's going to cause a civil war. Yeah. What about, are you talking, say, the actual attorney? They can serve in this role or a, a financial institution. They can, but yeah, you know, we're we're pretty uncomfortable with agreeing to be a trustee. We have we mm-hmm. have done that, but it's it's potentially it's difficult for a lawyer to be in that role. So uh, we don't we don't seek it. Let me make that mm-hmm. clear. We don't seek it, and we don't even prefer it, quite frankly. Yeah. But yeah, you can have financial institutions. Um, like corporate trustees, like financial institutions, sometimes right. they have like a pool of trustees that professionally serve in this role. Um, and, and there are but, some advantages to that, right? Yeah, I mean it's advantage, advantageous in that it prov- provides this objective like adjudicator in some ways about how the distributions are made. And then so there isn't as much, oh, why did mom's mom split the, the assets this way or why was this person appointed in that role? And, and you know, so, and also though – you have deep pockets. So the role mm-hmm. of a fiduciary is um, it's immense and it has a lot of discretion and authority and lots of opportunity for poor decisions, mm-hmm. even dishonest decisions, mm-hmm. though more often it's just bad decisions rather than, than dishonest ones. But in any case, if you have an institutional trustee, and that sounds so cold, but it can be someone at your local bank that you mm-hmm. know. I mean, this, these right. are people. They're not really... It's not a, a, a big building. It's actually <laughs> people. So people that are assigned. And, and um, th- what they do is they assure that it's done in a business-like fashion. Their lawyers within the company or the bank are monitoring it. You have insurance, lots of insurance. 
So if there is a misstep, there's recourse. But if Uncle Bob, if Uncle Bob, you know, invests in a a cattle ranch in Texas that somebody saw him coming, uh, then it's gone. Yeah. I mean, the money's mm-hmm. gone. Yeah. There's no recourse. Even if you sue him or even if it's fraud, there's no satisfaction in that because you're not going to get your money back. Um, so I, the nice thing about institutional trustees, you can count on them. There's continuity. So if somebody gets sick or ill or dies or decides I don't want to do this anymore, there's continuity. Um, and another thing is that it is more personal than most people think. I, I'll, I'm not trying to plug any place in particular, but one bank that we do some business with is, is Commerce. And I can tell you that Commerce, um, I mean, it's very personal. They have somebody who will go and shop for things. And you don't have to be rich. Now, it's true that these are people generally probably north of 500000 in assets. Sure. But, mm-hmm. but uh, still, I, I don't want people thinking that these are rich people as you normally think of rich. This is not. This is the person next door probably, if not uh, you. And, and so they will provide things like they'll shop and get clothes for their people. They will stop by and visit them periodically and – I mean, so there is a very personal aspect to it, uh, much more so than you would think with an institutional trustee. They charge um, – what do they charge, Teresa, around – I mean, not – I don't want to – I actually can't – I don't – I don't want to focus just on commerce. Yeah. So that's not fair. But so let's say that many will say charge, what, 1% is typical? Yeah, it's like 1% to 2%, I think, of the trust Yeah, states, uh, of the amount. They call it the RAS, but, yeah. but the, the total value of the state they're managing, the assets. You know, so if it's if it's a, a million dollars and you're talking about ten to $20,000 a year. But if you think about it, 1% or even 2% is very reasonable for somebody to help you with right. your life. And uh, I don't want to overstate that case. They can't come to your house every day and run errands for you. But I will tell you, it, there is a very personal dimension to it. And they do take care of your assets, and, and they're somebody to turn to that you know will be there when you need them to. So um, I'm actually a fan of, of uh, institutional trustees if you find a good, a good bank. Yeah. Often it's banks. doesn't have to be. But, uh, but often they will, they will give you a lot of return for the amount that you pay. And I think bottom line, whether you choose an institution or a, a relative, it has to be done to avoid probate. Right. Yeah. Be- like the whole point mm-hmm. of a trust is to avoid probate because things you put in are not going through probate. So. That's because right. Because probate yeah. can be a real challenge and yeah. take a long time to really settle. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. So, I mean, we've talked about it before, but still people don't often, I understand it's confusing. They don't understand how a will really means that you go through probate versus Mm -hmm. a trust. Yeah, I mean, the way I think of a will, very simply, it's just an instruction sheet to probate court. It doesn't mean that things that you are passing down through a will are kind of avoiding probate. It's just saying, oh, you're telling the judge how to pass the assets, meaning that all the downsides of probate are still there, even if you pass assets through a will, meaning the cost of probate, and that's based on Missouri statutory fees that can run from 5% to 20% wow. of your total estate. 20%. Yeah, I mean, that's depending on the size of your estate, sure. right? But it's still a significant mm. chunk of money that could be passed down to your loved ones instead of having to, you know, pay an attorney to help you through the probate administration exactly. process. Exactly. Um, and it can take a while, like you kind of hinted at. Um, for us, for our probate ca- cases that we take, it takes about an average of a year to finish everything. Um, when you open a probate matter, um, there's a six-month period where creditors can come forward to lay claim against a state so that they sure. have to be paid. So there's just a lot more waiting around and um, timelines, deadlines in the probate process. So what if someone you know thinks, well, I might avoid probate by putting um, a loved one, you know, my adult son on my house as a co-owner. That can be dangerous because, say, that loved one, adult mm-hmm. son in this case, is named in a lawsuit. Exactly. And yeah. oh, there are just numerous reasons, but you're yeah. right. That's but one. That is one thing that could happen. Your your home could become, you know, part at of risk. The, exactly. I mean, more than yeah, just like more than a lawsuit. If there are just creditors, if the, the other co owner have creditors or a lawsuit against them, that home that 
the asset that you kind of own together with them, what's yours is theirs too, which means what's theirs is open to grabs by their creditors and people who are laying claims against them. There are just so many reasons that's a bad idea. But you're right. You named one of them. But what about divorce? So yeah, I mean, that's another. you put it in the name of your daughter who's married, you know, who made perhaps a, a bad decision in a marriage and suddenly there's a divorce and there's this asset that's in her name. Even mm-hmm. if it's just half the asset, if you have both names on it, depending on whether it's joint tenancy or, or whether it's tenants in common, whatever, that's going, the other side's going to argue that's a marital asset. Mm-hmm. Have you ever represented someone that had that happen? Oh, I can't tell you how many times where... Parents, they do lots of, there are various ways in which this happens. One is where the parents will make a gift of something to their child for purposes of what they think is to avoid probate, or they think that it qualifies them for Medicaid, um, or maybe they just really intend it on its most innocent level. They, they just intended to give a gift to their daughter specifically, but they don't make that clear. In any case, it ends up in the daughter's name. And then it comes time for divorce. And, of course, Cordell and Cordell is always representing the guy. So, you know, we always troll through the financials and everything looking for any transfers or gifts or inheritances that have occurred. And and those are, I can tell you, there will be a dispute over that about whether or not uh, the husband is entitled to a portion of that. And often he is, not always, but often he is. And it it's just a, a very messy situation that the parents are just appalled. They never saw that coming. And of course, obviously this gift could be to the, to the son as well, uh, but, but it seems that it often comes up in the context where an asset is transferred to the daughter in, you know, with one of these intentions, but mm-hmm. n- none of those intentions included the idea of making a gift to their soon-to-be ex-son-in-law ex. <laughs> and, and, yeah. perhaps, and perhaps their least favorite person on the planet at that point. So um, another thing is, is liability, if, if there's a car accident or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, another is, um, you know, we think we know our kids, but sometimes the kids will decide that they want to do something different. And if you have any doubt about that, then you don't want to place something in a child's name where they have as much control over it as you do. And circumstances may change, and maybe the child feels they need the money, and so they decide to sell it. So that you just lose or control. Borrow against the house. Yeah, they mm-hmm. could do that. Take a loan out. They yeah. could do that, and you would have no control over that. Yeah, yeah, um, and just bankruptcy, just bad debts. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, so many things. Uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those um, really really bad decisions that people sometimes do in an effort to do some sort of estate planning. Yeah, yeah. some people think, oh, I get to avoid probate because this we're is really coroners. smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and another yeah. issue we haven't even talked about is the tax implications. <laughs> Now, remember, if you transfer an asset, the other person owns half of that so uh, or some fraction, whatever it is. And so depending on whether there's income associated or expenses associated, remember, it, even property taxes, guess who has an obligation under the law to pay some portion of the property taxes? And then finally, what would have been a stepped-up tax basis at your death, so let's assume that you own a house that's worth a million dollars, and, um, and you paid $100,000, so there's $900,000 gain potentially. Now, there are some advantages, some tax credits you get when you sell a home, but putting aside that. So by going ahead and doing a lifetime transfer, you're losing the opportunity as to most of that to, to get this stepped-up basis where you'd never owe any tax liability at all because it would pass through the trust, which would be the same as through the will for tax purposes. Um, so we could go on and on. Yeah. And for those of you just tuning in, we have as our guest, Teresa Yao, an attorney with Tucker Allen. And Teresa, I want to go over a, a scenario with you. Okay. Say your client's only major assets are, you know, a home and a bank account less than $10,000. Mm-hmm. Would you advise that client to just do a beneficiary deed and a, a POD with the bank? 
Explain what those are, though. Uh, Payable, Teresa. You're right. Yeah. So a beneficiary deed is um, essentially something you can record on your property that says, after I pass away, I want this person or this asset, uh, this um, entity to receive the house after I pass away. But while you're still alive, you can still do whatever you want with house, manage it. Um, and a POD, it stands for payable on death. And that's just um, a, des- a beneficiary designation you can set up on bank accounts, different types of accounts saying, hey, after I pass away, I want my account to be payable on death to this beneficiary. But in the meantime, you own it, yes. right? Yeah. So it's not like you transfer. When you put their name on it, it's not as an owner. Yeah. Right. It, it while you're alive, you're the owner. You're the yeah. owner. But mm-hmm. after you pass away, it goes to that person. Yeah. And it is a pretty swift process to transfer assets. Um, in terms of that scenario where their only assets are or major assets are a house and a bank account, I mean, it really depends because that's like their two major assets. But I'd want to know more about their whole asset portfolio. Like if they have a bunch of minor assets, that's very diverse. It, you have to be really vigilant about upkeeping your beneficiaries on all these different beneficiary designations. Because let's say the person you have POD to were to pass away or something or they were to become incapacitated, then you'd have to revisit that your account and make sure you update it according to the life changes. Um, and some people are good ab- about that. It also depends on the personality of the client, whether they are good about it. Um, and it's just a lot of like monitoring and upkeep if you just say, oh, I want an individual to be the beneficiary and have that be the beneficiary designation on the accounts. I would think that it would work in a situation where you only had one child. Well, you can do beneficiary designation saying I want it to be split between these two people. Like you can say POD to two different de- beneficiaries. So you can like right. it doesn't have to be POD to one person. Um, but I actually normally recommend a trust anyways, just because that's like the peace of mind for a long term. Right. Because right. the trust evolves as your life changes. Right. So you don't have to change the POD just because one of your beneficiaries or something were to happen to them or, you know, if they were to be become incapacitated because your trust, your trustees take care of those, um, like has a discretion to address those um, life changes. And it doesn't have any benefit either for you while you're alive. If you're wanting to do estate planning that, Mm -hmm. and estate planning properly understood is going to take care of you for the balance of your life and then for those you care about when you're gone. So a trust is wonderful because you choose who your successor trustee is going to be. In other words, you start out in charge. And this is very easy. It's not complicated. So no one needs to have special training to to have a revocable trust. Mm -hmm. And so these are typically fully revocable. That's what most people want. There are some circumstances where we'd recommend an irrevocable. But for most people, fully revocable. So they can change it, blow it up, get rid of it anytime they want, which, you know, I've never seen happen. Uh, Mm -hmm. So they they name themselves to be in charge of everything, but then they get to say in these these instructions that, look, if something happens, if I have a stroke or a heart attack or or I develop dementia and I can't manage my stuff, this is the person I want to to be next. And then they can even name a person after that. So Mm -hmm. you get to choose successors. So you're 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 able to have somebody in charge of your assets the moment that something happens to you. And usually we back this up with a durable power of attorney. So this is not a substitute completely for a durable power of attorney. There will still be some assets that and, and some questions and issues that you'll want a durable power of attorney. And often it's the same person. So the person that you choose for your durable power of attorney, you can choose your successor trustee. Mm-hmm. But it's nice. It's a wonderful place where there's a set of rules in place and it's just centrally managed as opposed to a number of things floating out there in space that you hope that people will find and manage correctly. And then the moment you die, it's so smooth. Your assets are in one place. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have – it's very unusual to have like two assets, but Mm -hmm. most people will have various things. And then even if you did have, say, two larger assets that you are mainly concerned about, the the trust, just the way it was customized to take care of you during your life – Most people, when they think about it, they decide that rather than dump those assets on their loved ones all at once when they pass away, in other words, to distribute them immediately, is not as good for them as if they let let it continue to have the protection of a trust so that they have asset protection 
So this mm-hmm. is not based on your loved ones being incompetent or bad decision makers or irresponsible. And some people think, oh, when you have a trust continue in existence for those that are the beneficiaries, then you must think your kids are somehow irresponsible. Sometimes that's true. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but for most of our clients, uh, it, it's really a situation that we're going to give them something better than this $500,000 home or whatever. Yeah. We can mm-hmm. do better than that because we're going to give them that. They'll have the assets, but we're going to keep it in the trust. They'll get to use it, and it'll be totally asset protected so that if, if they get sued by somebody or they have a bad marriage, you know, all those things continue to be protected versus dumping it in their lap the day you die yeah. well, and or I a think, few days later. You know, going back to, you know, talking about it protects you while you're living, this offers a safety net for that client, yeah. for that person. Because if they become incapacitated, somebody has to pay their bills. Um, somebody may, has to make health care decisions. Yeah, exactly. And the trust is definitely, like the will doesn't do that for you, right? Right. Like the trust is the thing that does that. And so, so. if we could talk about the um, advanced health care directives and, and what that does... Yeah, so the Advanced Healthcare Directive, it's just that document. The Healthcare Directive, it's different from a medical part of attorney because the Healthcare Directive is just that one end of life care document where you're making a testament to your doctors um, saying that if I, if my doctor, in a second opinion, were to determine that I have a terminal illness and I have a very low likelihood of recovering or like living a meaningful life after, then all you want is just comfort care, palliative care, and you want to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment. So that's what the Advanced Healthcare Directive is. Um, and a lot of times that's coupled with the healthcare power of attorney, right? Because that document is only end of life. But the healthcare power of attorney, it spans a much larger range of healthcare decisions that you can appoint somebody you trust to help take care of your health, of your body when you're unga- unable to do so anymore. And it can be very personalized. Oh, like you absolutely. Said. You so, can say, I want this treatment and I don't want this treatment. Like some people find the idea of intubation, like artificial food and water, like very jarring. And then they don't want intubation, but they do want like CPR or something. So it's just, you can tailor it in terms of so I, treatments. So if, if say, you know, you, you have no brain activity. You would want, um, say, four doctors to state that before being taken off life support. It can be down, that detailed. I mean, if you want to tailor it, yeah, you can. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Okay. But you, you may not want four doctors. Yeah, that well, might be yeah, really I know. a large barrier but, to cross. Yeah, but. yeah I, I but would yes. want maybe a low bar on that point. If the issue is whether I have brain activity, I think I'm okay <laughs> with just saying, look, let's just assume we're there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the option is there. It That's is the there. exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, it, but but it is an it is an important piece that you raise is um, when you think about kind of the the documents that that give you a a complete set of safety and security, then then it needs to include that durable power of attorney for healthcare because mm-hmm. it does cover things that are very personal to your health and safety that really a regular trustee doesn't deal with. They're managing your assets. Mm-hmm. And the person with the durable power of attorney is typically managing legal and business and financial things. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it may be this, it's often in fact a different person that has the sort of sensitive relationship with you that you want to trust their judgment on that. Mm-hmm. So um, I guess then we would wrap this conversation up by coming back to the, the point that we started with. These are crazy times, lots of uncertainty in more ways than one. And, and what, a better, what better occasion to think about getting the things in place that arguably are among the most important things we'll do in our lifetime. I mean, we worked so hard to get where we are. You know, we've, we, you, we've all had a lifetime of planning. Sure. And uh, some plans have gone uh, as designed and others not so much. But anyway... It, it just seems a shame that, that we plan so much during the early part of our lives and then at the time when, when it will be determined what is the ultimate outcome of all those efforts, we fail to show up. We fail yeah. to, to do any planning whatsoever. So what we've been talking about here is really about those ingredients of a great plan. And we're mm-hmm. so grateful that Teresa Yao uh, with Tucker Allen could come and join us again and 
lay it out for us and help us navigate through the process. I'm happy to do so. Thank you, Teresa. I'm sure we'll we'll want you back. Uh, you were very popular in the past, and I'm sure that'll continue. So we appreciate your coming. Thank you. All right. This has been another episode of Elder Talk. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Tucker Allen. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.